Hi, my name is Rolf Brink. I'm the founder and CEO of Asperitas, and I'm the immersion industry lead within the Advanced Schooling Solutions subproject of Open Compute. Asperitas is a leading immersion cooling provider, which is providing data centers around the globe with high quality immersion solutions. The Asperitas technology is the highest quality and most efficient cooling technology on the market due to the unique and patented immersed computing concept, which is driven by natural convection circulation. This means that Asperita circulates a dielectric liquid without any pumps and enables high availability implementations for mainstream enterprise and cloud workloads. But this session is not about the Asperitas technology though. If you wish to know more about the Asperitas technology, I would like to refer you to our website and one of the many freely accessible recordings at Open Compute where we have given numerous workshops on Asperitas technology and the knowledge we bring into the industry. This session is about the industry and how the industry is changing shape around us. It is also a bit about the role which Asperitas plays in the industry to facilitate a growing need for radical change. A change which not only solves some technological challenges, but also a change towards sustainability. This sustainability focus is what drives Asperitas and other people involved in our ecosystem of partners and collaborators. Let's dive in and have a quick look at what a combined industry looks like today. The Uptime Institute has recently released a report which describes some very fundamental data about what is currently happening in the data center industry. This provides a good view of where the data center industry stands today. And it is pretty exciting if you ask me. A lot is happening. Uh, despite COVID-19 this year, there's an accelerated and unprecedented move towards cloud-based platforms. Well, it's actually thanks to COVID-19, I would almost say. Data centers are now more critical than ever. We are also seeing the start of the 5G rollout, which is accompanied by increased data generation and an additional load on the infrastructures. On parallel, the chip densities have been increasing dramatically. Where only a few years ago we were working with 40 watt processors, now the lowest spec is around 135 watts, while average chips have been nearing 200 watts. And this is only for mainstream enterprise platforms. HPC platforms are on the rise as well, often driven by artificial intelligence and machine learning workloads. Servers requiring two kilowatts per rack unit are no longer an exception which means that we just explored one of the first challenges which we're facing in the whole industry today. This increase in chip power is not something temporary. There is already talks about raising these levels to 400 and eventually 800 and 1000 watts. This is not something which the industry can support in most current facilities. At the same time, the industry is trying to increase efficiency and reduce cost. This is at conflict with the higher densities, as these are getting more and more difficult to condition and keep protected. The technologies which the industry has depended on for so long are still innovating to accommodate this. But all innovations and optimizations in this area are in the last remaining margins of what is possible. The urgency for efficiency is furthermore pressured by a drive for sustainability. The entire planet is focused on climate change and steps must be radical to ensure that our children will have a safe environment to live in. The data center industry is responsible for a significant part of that global energy footprint, which is why it is a logical and impactful target for sustainability measures. Creating and valorizing heat from data centers is therefore one of the main challenges for the industry. Last, but at least there is a new driver in the industry and it's called 5G. The global rollout results in an exponential increase in data processing and due to latency and infrastructure costs, this processing will take place in the edge. There have been many talks in the industry which relate to edge, but let me be short. Edge is where data is being created. Edge is where connectivity is always moving and where the information demand is. Edge is the people people driving cars, people watching online content, and people's devices collecting data for advertising, and people re receiving the same advertising. Edge is where the people are. 
And where there are people, there is data processing, and where there's data processing, there, processing, there is a need for data centers. This results in a global urbanization of data centers with all challenges which are associated with such environments. But luckily, there's good news on the horizon. In 2020, sustainability goals have become a fundamental part of corporate strategies worldwide. And this is emphasized with the big announcements of this year by the hyperscale facilities. All main hyperscale companies have announced their commitment to become carbon negative by 2030. Amazon by 2040. Microsoft has taken this mission even further by committing to the full erasure of their entire historical carbon footprint by 2050. These plans are welcomed by two of the largest economies in the world, the European Union and China. Europe has set the ambitious goal to become climate neutral as a continent by 2050, followed by China with a pledge to become carbon neutral by 2060. And let me be clear, this is the kind of leadership which the world really needs right now. Other good news is the fact that the projected apocalyptic energy explosion has not occurred in this industry. The, Europe the European data center industry was responsible for 2.7% of the electrical demand in 2018 and is now projected to grow to 3.2% by 2030. It is important to mention here that a significant part of the industry remains unmonitored. This refers to cryptocurrency and many single tenants, which can be considered corporate facilities. So with all the great news, we can all sit back now and be comfortable that all is good, right? Well, not that simple. Uh, let me take you to the other side of the same story. All the pledges are great, but there, is a, there are dark clouds over the windmills. Across Europe, there are green energy projects like windmills, solar farms, and many other smaller initiatives which are subsidized with community funds to allow local economies to move away from fossil energy. These subsidies usually end up with the utility companies, which are commonly large international conglomerates. The drive to decarbonization brings the largest data centers to, place where, to places where green and renewable power is being created and it's being created with these community funds. These facilities require such high energy amounts that they often are sized to the full renewable power envelopes. This means that the community investments are spent on foreign entities, which are selling almost of the renewable energy to hyperscale, which are also foreign entities, while local economies deal with the burdens of the wind parks in their backyards without any return on investment as all money flows elsewhere. The subsidies are supposed to help these economies to become more sustainable, but instead large corporates are getting the subsidized green business models. To make matters worse, most hyperscale facilities have so far paid insufficient attention to heat reuse even though reuse often was a condition for allowing a facility to be built in the first place. And this results in many areas now starting to regulate data centers and the creation of legislation around energy and the reuse of heat. Amsterdam is a front runner in policy making and implemented full data center moratorium in 2019 to allow a full reassessment of the possibilities which, has result, which have resulted in the first solid regulations for data center development with a focus on reuse. These regulations come on top of the already ambitious existing regulations which require new data, centers develop, that data center developments to design for PUE of 1.2. But also PUE is under evaluation. According to the Uptime Institute, PUE has flatlined over the past six years PUE has served an important and fundamental goal, but from a global perspective, facilities are no longer inefficient when looking at PUE alone. The very low PUE values around the Arctic Circle, for example, are offset by the industry growth in tropical areas where PUE of 2.0 can still be considered very efficient. In fact, the measures taken to achieve the efficiency of data centers are now becoming a new focus for sustainability. And this relates to water usage due to an explosive growth of adiabatic or evaporative cooling. The evaporative element being the obvious culprit. 
The evaporation losses have a growing impact on one of the planet's scarce resources, water. Many, reg many regions in the world are suffering from ever-increasing water shortages and wasting this resource on the cooling of data centers is becoming a much broader problem than ever before. We are, after all, spending valuable resources on the destruction of exergy. Exergy being the usability of energy. Electrical energy is never consumed, but instead it's converted into heat. The primary function of cooling is to get rid of this heat as efficiently as possible. But heat is also energy. You see, this is why PoE is now becoming a problem. After many years of good service, it's time to let go of this KPI as a dominating factor for the industry. Any energy which is spent on improving XG will likely end up with a negative effect on PUE. Adding a heat pump to an existing free cooling installation which is designed to simply throw out the hot air will have a negative effect on PUE. This is often mentioned as a reason for hyperscale facilities to be adverse to these principles. In the facility, uh, if a facility has reached this economical achievable efficiency, the PUE metric should simply be abandoned and other KPIs should take over. An example of such a KPI is ERF, or energy reuse factor. ERF indicates how much of the electrical energy is actually converted and delivered as usable heat. This means that the same energy which is used for the IT equipment is given a second life for a completely different process. The applications for such heat reuse are numerous and not limited to the heating of households. Try to search online for fourth generation heat grids and these grids are rolled out now and will gain momentum in the upcoming years across Europe. These heat grids will be able to take heat directly from facilities and distribute it across, across a large network of consumers. Heat reuse is important to consider because when heat is delivered, cooling is supplied in return. Therefore, reuse is cooling without spending the power or the money on expensive installations, which are only focused on getting rid of the energy. Now, as already mentioned, edge developments are accelerated by the global 5G rollout, which is coming with an exponential increase of data processing across distributed micro data centers. These facilities will have to be deployed in both remote and urban environments. This provides a whole new range of challenges ranging from available power connectivity to cost of footprint and noise nuisance. Highly efficient climate independent platforms with minimized overhead are required to meet these challenges globally. So how do we address all these challenges? Well, the good news is that we've seen all these challenges coming at us for years now. In 2017, I even wrote a, and published a white paper which was dedicated to most, if not all, of the challenges mentioned so far. This paper will be updated in 2021, and we aim to republish this with a broader community through open compute. Basically, everything comes down to a fundamental shift to liquid cooling. Everybody in the industry is now familiar with at least the concept of liquid cooling, but still only a handful are actually using, deploying, and scaling with liquid cooling. The most well-known form of liquid cooling now relates to rear door coolers. These are water-cooled heat exchangers which act as air handlers at the rear door of the rack. These are efficient and eliminate the need for facility-wide air transport. These are currently the new norm for air cooling and are integrated in the new OCP rec definitions. Cold plate is mostly applied in the HPC and supercomputing environments while, while now becoming an occasional add-on for mainstream systems. Full cold plate racks are often equipped with rear door coolers because cold plates only cool the most essential and hottest chips in the rack. Immersion is also known from HPC applications and is now breaking through to become a mainstream strategy for HPC and high density platforms. The biggest value of immersion lies in the holistic cooling approach. Since the IT equipment is fully immersed, 100% of the converted energy is captured in the dielectric liquid. 
And this holistic cooling ability is therefore the most important contributor to addressing efficiency and sustainability goals. This becomes clear when looking at the more explicit effects of liquid cooling strategies. Rear door heat exchanges are very efficient to, due to the usage of water as the main coolant circulation throughout the facility. This enables more efficient distribution and transport of heat and more efficient cooling. It is after all easier to exchange heat with water than it is with air. However, because they function in the same way as air handlers, low temperature cooling will still be required. This effect becomes clear when looking at PUE impacts of different technologies. And please be aware that these graphs on the right side of this slide are not representative of your facility or any other specific deployment. It is meant to make a point, that is all. Cold plate implementations are allowing at least part of the infrastructure to work with elevated, uh, elevated temperatures, which in return allows more efficient and compressorless cooling measures around the world. In addition, cold plate allows the reduction of IT footprints due to the capture of heat within the chassis, which means that the internal cooling systems of a server are no longer managing the chip heat, but they are still required because all other components are not cooled by the same cold plate. Because of this, cold plate is often combined with, with rear door coolers to allow full capture of all the heat at rec level. This also means that part of the rack still requires low temperature cooling while other parts can operate with elevated temperatures. Approximately 60% of the IT energy can operate with elevated temperatures while the rest remains cold water cooled. Immersion is about literally immersing the IT systems in the dielectric fluid. And this holistic type of cooling, which captures 100% of IT energy, can operate with, with elevated temperatures for the full, tep full platform. This also means that immersion enables year-round operation with free cooling strategy. The elevated temperature capabilities also have significant impact on the potential energy reuse factor. The shown pie charts give an indication of achievable ERF with different liquid cooling strategies. And a small note should be added though, that everything which I just explained is dependent on the IT platform, which needs to support the same elevated temperatures and heat production with liquid cooling. HPC and supercomputing operators would prefer to stick with chilled water circuits if that enables higher clock speeds, while mainstream enterprise applications often allow more focus on high temperature operation. So the liquid cooling strategies also have a tremendous impact on TCO models. These effects are caused by the consolidation of IT, which is made possible by the higher achievable densities with liquid cooling and the ability to work with elevated temperatures. Some of the effects may conflict with each other, so this list should not be considered as a cumulative list. The TCO effects apply to any liquid cooling strategy and depend on how far liquid cooling is optimized across a facility. BUE will have a great impact and depending on the technology, will have an impact on the IT load as well, which can simultaneously allow much further energy reduction, resulting in reduced energy requirements for increased capacity for the facility. Especially in case of, uh, case of HPC applications, existing cold water circuits can be utilized to increase CPU performance. In general, cold plate and immersion technology will allow full CPU boost, boost operations continuously. The physical footprint reduction is achieved by the IT consolidation, power savings, and more efficient free air cooling. The energy reuse potential is, of course, dependent on the chosen technology. If, for example, an edge facility is integrated in urban environments with immersion cooling, an ERF can be achieved at 99% due to the integration into localized and even industrial heat demand. All of these factors can add up to a potential of 50% TCO reductions. A cherry on the pie which should not be ignored is that elevated temperature operation allows the elimination of evaporative cooling, thus addressing the water consumption challenges. This will stimulate further political support in scaling out data center strategy towards sustainability. So there is a lot which needs to happen in the industry and some of that may not be fully scaled yet. But what does it take to change a global industry? It all starts with moving away from disruptive claims 
and, global and a global focus on facts. It is widely known that real change is often driven by smaller and more flexible innovative companies. This is great, of course, but there is the added dimension that the sheer amount of conflicting statements in combination with a fundamental resistance against change is creating a lot of confusion around valuable technology. Data center operators and experts in availability and up, uh, are experts in availability and uptime. The last thing they will do is take risks with confusing information and incredible marketing picture, pitches. Any technology which is allowed into the facility is subjected to a good amount of scrutiny and any doubts raised in the industry will not only affect a single brand, but the entire technology domain. Think of it like this. Tesla had a few instances of electrochemical failure, which resulted in exploding batteries. This has put a stigma on electrical vehicles for quite some time. In fact, the propensity and severity of such fires and explosions are far less than those for gasoline and diesel fuel cars. But it is the novelty factor which puts good innovations at a disadvantage. And it takes time and lots of facts to break that barrier. In addition, collection of data and sharing data is also at odds with confidentiality, especially when innovators are risking everything to break across the chasm. The wealth of information and knowledge becomes IP, which must be protected. This highlights a difficult balance for new technologies to maintain. After all, a technology needs to scale for itself, but cannot do so if information about it cannot be shared. A way to deal with this is to open the floodgates and allow a rising tide which, lift, which lifts all boats. And this is exactly what the Open Compute project is facilitating. Open Compute is a cross-industry collaboration which is providing the industry with unbiased facts and often includes data to back it up. This is because all the progress in OCP is community driven. And this is done by open sourcing any work that comes out of it. Since open computer is driven by hyperscale companies, it is often more progressive than ASHRAE or other existing platforms and more focused on the front of the way. Open Compute was the first global platform which adopted liquid cooling as a strategic focus with the establishment of the Advanced Cooling Solutions Project, or ACS. This ACS charter is focused on standardization and, of definitions, uh, and definitions of crucial interfaces, operational parameters, and environmental conditions. The charter has several subdivisions which are focused on the different technology families. Redo Heat Exchanges, led by Jacob Nah from Facebook, Cold Plate, which is led by Michael Berktold from Intel, and Immersion, which is led by myself, Rolf Brink from Asperitas. A recent addition to the OCP portfolio is the new Community Advanced Cooling Facilities, or ACF, which is focused on the harmonization between the different cooling families and is creating reference designs, which will allow further adoption of liquid cooling worldwide. This community is led by Don Mitchell from Victolic and John Minocci from Vertic. The different communities are very active in the creation of content, and I'm proud to state that Immersion is considered one of the most active communities within ACS. To date, ACS has produced Immersion and Cold Plate requirements, documents outlining basic compliance items for the respective technologies for adoption within OCP. These are combined with compliance checklists which provide guidance for operators and vendors to design against. Last week, a white paper was presented to the OCP Incubation Committee, which is a very progressive paper outlining design guidelines for immersion cooled IT equipment. It is a paper which contains a wealth of information and knowledge which has been kept under varying confidentiality layers within various companies. But this information is now combined, bundled and organized in a paper which will help and facilitate OEMs in their support strategies for immersion. This paper goes even further by providing guidance on how to unlock a whole new potential for IT equipment and the chips used within. Within Immersion, there are now two accepted specifications, both aimed at enabling further adoption of Immersion. 
Fan simulators allow the immersion of systems which are unable to operate without fans for pilot implementations. And the open cassette specification is an immersion optimized, uh, optimized chassis which follows all the guidelines of the design guidelines for immersion cooled IT equipment paper. To date, Asperitas is the only spec contributor in ACS, but we expect it to change in the upcoming year. And there are two new projects which have been kicked off in the past months. One is the community effort to revise and update the immersion requirements specifications to revision two. And there is the fluid compatibility group, which has its roots in the white paper and focuses on the standards and definitions for fluid related material compatibility for all IT equipment. And these groups are open to the global industry. Anyone can dial in and join the conversations to, comp to contribute content. Uh, to contribute content, an OCP membership will be required. OCP has defined sustainability and liquid cooling as a strategic focus for 2021. And this supports the industry transition which is happening and boosts the readiness level of all liquid technologies to scale alongside this industry. This means that we will see more alignment across industries which is focused on liquid cooled facilities and IT equipment stronger alignment with the energy sector and a closer involvement from hyperscale companies to drive the progression. And this type of cross-industry collaboration is essential and goes much further than just swapping out some labels. This change is fundamental and creates new insights, structures and models along the way to support the global transition to sustainable data centers. Energy reuse, triggers a new view on relations with utility companies. Utilities will transform to becoming business partners instead of regular suppliers. Don't forget, it's the utilities who are carrying the burden to make the European energy transition happen. It is they who have a need for data center heat and provide economic incentives to heat suppliers. With the increased robustness of facilities, these become more versatile, agile and flexible, which opens the door to a variety of new business models. Edge developments are popping up everywhere, providing serious acceleration to ambitious smart city initiatives and increasing heat, re heat reuse models. So what's the rush? Why is all this happening now? There are good reasons to want this transition right now. And these reasons should not be ignored. Before getting into these, let's look back at the past year and answer the following question for me. Who led the digital transformation of your company? And take your pick, A, B, or C. If somebody came up to you exactly one year ago and would tell you that it would be possible to do all office work remotely in half a year time, what would your response have been? I know what mine would have been like. It, is all, it all comes down to necessity. COVID-19 forced an immediate change around the world in record time. Businesses were all facing an, existen an existential crisis. But luckily, the tools existed to deal with this. These tools had already been developed, tested, and prepared over the past years. But nobody had seen COVID-19 coming. The paradigm shift for the data centers is something which we have all had in plain sight. The industry has been calling for change during the last five years. The foundation for this change is driven by technology relating to Moore's law and sustainability relating to efficiency and growth. Chip power is exceeding what is possible to maintain with air. It is pure scientific and we have seen this tipping point coming at us. It is the fundamental resistance against change which puts the industry in a position from which it tries and protects the status quo. Platforms like ASHRAE, institutes like Uptime, global providers like Slider, Snyder Electric and many, many others have flooded the industry with warnings about the persistence of air cooling and how that will prevent the industry from dealing with the new realities. This is nothing like COVID-19. The surprise element does not exist. We know when and where it will happen because there is, a plenty, there is plenty of statistical and scientific data underlining the most important message of today. This is no longer a future projection. This is about today. Why is it then that there are still so many facilities, operators and large cloud providers who are ignoring this reality? 
it all relates to a classical friend or foe comparison. The resistance against change and the perceived risk of the unknown. It is incredibly important to realize that change always comes with opportunity. The real challenge is to determine whether you can benefit from the opportunity or not. Therefore, it is important to understand the fundamental aspects of the changing parameters to allow the identification of real threats and opportunities. These opportunities may often be hidden in plain sight. Think of it, think of it like this. Liquid cooling is still cooling. There is no reduction of the amount of joules which are generated or rejected. This means that your basic operation is still focused on maintaining that thermal balance, just in a different way. It also means that the supply chain can look at heat pumps as portfolio additions to chiller installations. The basic technology understanding is not much different. It is merely the implementation type which really changes. There are numerous heat pumps an experimental level, on experimental level that allow for 40 to 120 degrees, but not yet in standard portfolios as the producers do not see the skill yet to justify. Understanding reuse potentials is also an important factor to consider. Don't forget that supplying heat to something means you get cooling as a service, free of charge. And depending on the temperature which you can achieve, you will even make money out of it. Offset this with your electrical bill, and in time, the industry can move energy cost from cost to profit, if played smart. The consolidation and simplification allows further growth without expanding the footprint. Think of it this way. If you can reduce the square meters footprint with 50%, what becomes more cost effective? Digging a new power cable into your facility or building the whole, whole new one? If you don't need the remaining square meters, other purposes can be assigned to remaining floor space and freed up overhead assets. With the simplification of these infrastructures, it becomes easier to roll out facilities with greater freedom for site planning within urban areas. This again allows for intelligence energy solutions, enabling smart services. This list can go on for several more slides and gets too deep and detailed for this session, but I hope it's clear that there is tremendous opportunity in this transition and we need to help and buy in, and we need the help and the buy in of the entire industry to ensure a solid foundation for the next 30 years of decarbonization and integration of digital infrastructures in our global society. And you can help this transition with leading by example. Asperitas is doing precisely this, and we have been working consistently across industry boundaries and while seeking out alignment and partnerships with competitors even to ensure the realization of common goals. Asperitas has been facilitating global, the industry alignment through open compute by sharing valuable knowledge and experience. We have a good understanding of where global, st global standards will stimulate or slow down the progression of liquid cooling in general and immersion technology specifically. We actively share a vision and strategy in the public domain. In line with this, we are guiding optimization efforts for reference infrastructures. Your, the Asperitas vision has been confirmed by the structures which are implemented within OCP and large industry partners alike. The division of liquid cooling families and harmonization structures are globally recognized. Aspiritus has been active in enabling the new ecosystems by planting the seeds and driving cross-industry collaboration with the utility ecosystems and governments to facilitate beneficial cross-industry synergies for heat reuse. Aspiritus have recognized for the expertise and clear focus on IT equipment as it is the core resp responsibility of liquid cooling to keep the most valuable assets safe and well protected. This is where we have established deep relations with the IT equipment manufacturer, and we support these in their strategy for immersion cooling. This has already resulted in several immersion optimized IT platforms, which will become available for broad industry rollout in 2021. We are doing much more than this, and it would not fit into the single slide, because the message behind this is that it takes much more than a spirit as alone. It takes more than any company alone to drive a global change across the industry. Collaboration is key for delivering a global carbon neutral industry, which has the robustness to deal with a new technological age and benefits from the buy-in from society 
to enable sustainable growth. Therefore, we need to collectively start preparing for liquid and sustainability. Prepare your facility for liquid in the white space. This may sound like this is a hurdle or a lot changes uh, or a lot of changes are required for liquid management or safety. But liquid cooling allows greater flexibility and accelerated growth. Asperitas can assist in the preparations and help to educate your teams with demonstrations, pilots, educational sessions and more. We understand that the IT platform owners are often customers of the facility operators and we can assist in, ass in assessing the value of liquid cooling for these customers and the benefits for the facilities. And we can provide guidance to plan your liquid cooling roadmap with your teams. But also without Asperitas, you can start engaging with your own ecosystem to prepare for liquid cooling. Consider your IT suppliers who also need to be ready for liquid cooling. Ensure, uh, inquire with your energy supplier about how they can help you with your heat load if you are able to valorize it, it appropriately. Engage with your customers to bring them to the table while, while being open to different revenue models when discussing the value add of liquid cooling. Engage with your local governments to discuss how policy changes over time may impact your business and get the buy-in to gain access to incentives, which will enrich your revenue streams and potential operating models. And last but not least, support the global transition by sharing your knowledge, expertise, and questions in the OCP community. Because this is where we are making the difference and where the industry also needs your support. It does not matter which company you work for or who your customers are. Your expertise is of great value to the global community and collaborations. These, the communities will allow you to gain valuable experience and insights by exposing you to the combined knowledge of fellow experts who operate all over the world. And with all resources combined, we are influencing and enabling something which is bigger than ourselves. We are building a better future for the industry, for society, and for our children. I thank you for your time.